fascism is a grossly overused term these days, frequently used synonymously with Nazi, racist, right-wing, etc. None of this is correct from a historical or ideological perspective, but it does beg the question, what is fascism? Specifically, is there a generic fascism we can use to identify it in the same way that we can classify the very different regimes of Stalinist Russia, Maoist China, and Tito's Yugoslavia as communist? I argue that yes, there is, and we can distill it by examining both historical examples and the fictional representations in our own culture. In the Galactic Empire, we see strong echoes of National Socialist Germany, not just in terms of visual style, but in how Palpatine comes to power and how he runs his empire. He's an elected politician, and while he has an army outside normal legal channels, he comes to power first through the democratic process and gains dictatorial powers only after the legislature passes an enabling act in response to a perceived emergency. Broadly speaking, the space Nazis track pretty close to the rise of the real thing. But in the historical example, the vote-getting, parliamentary maneuvering path to power was Plan B. And I'm going back further than the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, all the way back to 1918-1919. During this time, many of the men who had become prominent figures in the National Socialist German Workers' Party were involved in communist organizations. Hitler was on a soldiers' council in the Bavarian Soviet Republic. Julius Schreck, founder of the SS, was part of the Bavarian Soviet's army. But while we can say that Hitler and a few others were involved in communist organizations based on a few records of them holding these posts and some grainy photographs, for example, this one that probably shows Hitler present at Kurt Eisner's funeral, I don't think the evidence is strong enough to definitively say they were communists at the time. What we can say with certainty is they despised the Weimar Republic and wanted to overthrow it, but they weren't ultra-conservative reactionaries trying to restore the monarchy either. That doesn't mean that they were all dogmatic Marxists yammering on about the dictatorship of the proletariat and spontaneously singing the Internationale. It just meant they were socialist in their thinking, wanting to seize control of capital in the state as evidenced by the Nazi party's original 25-point program, and they were willing to use force to overthrow the state. They existed in the Weimar era stew of socialist ideas, and the various brands of revolutionary socialism had many disagreements, one of the biggest centering on internationalism versus nationalism. Germany's National Socialists, much like Mussolini's fascists, began on the fringes of the socialist movements of the day, which were built around internationalist Marxist ideology. But the men that went on to start the Nazi and fascist parties were nationalists who realized that the internationalism of the Marxists not only didn't appeal to them, but was not appealing to the masses. Germans and Italians didn't think of themselves as an international brotherhood of workers. Nation, culture, tradition, these things mattered. So while they retained the socialism, the program of state control over the means of production, they ditched the Marxism. Which leads to the absurd to us situation of the supposedly left-wing Gregor Strasser fighting in the supposedly ultra-right-wing Free Corps against the communist Bavarian Soviet, of which the future Fuhrer was a member. It was a different time. Today's political divisions don't apply very well. But with the failure of the communists to deliver on their promises when they had power, mutations intensified. The most notable was National Socialism, which replaced the Marxist focus on class as the unifying element with race, or the Volk. They were still socialists, still revolutionaries, but not Marxists. And Nazism, just like Italy's fascism, was an ideology of revolution. It sought to overthrow the existing order and remake society. There was nothing conservative about it. Today, socialists will vehemently disagree that fascism and Marxism are cousins, but it's a matter of historical record that no amount of Gramsci-esque maneuvering can erase. Coming back around here, the society presented in the Star Wars universe at the dawn of the Empire is vastly more conservative than the chaos of Weimar Germany, and Palpatine himself was a long-serving political figure from an aristocratic family, not some angry veteran or wild-eyed revolutionary. The Republic's institutions are tens of thousands of years old. It's not a foreign system imposed from outside at the point of a gun and teetering on the edge of collapse from day one. We see no organized socialist revolutionary movement, no Darth Marx trying to seize control of the Republic, and Palpatine rejecting his pan-galactic class rhetoric in favor of human supremacy. Palpatine's seizure of power is more like an aristocratic coup than a revolution. Which brings me to another historical detail that is often overlooked in the typical public consumption history of the interwar years. 
not all revolutions are created equal. For example, the Bolsheviks purged much of the Tsarist regime, replacing its people and institutions. The Communist Party, a political organization up to that point structured around overthrowing the Tsarist state, needed to establish its own state apparatus to carry out the functions of government, everything from collecting taxes to delivering mail to raising and maintaining an army. In the Soviet system, the state was subordinate to the party. The party made decisions, the state served only to implement them. In fascist Italy, the party was subordinate to the state. Mussolini was prime minister, but he was answerable to the king who could remove him, which he eventually did, but not until the Allies were already invading Italy. The fascist party had enormous influence over Italian policy, but it was largely because Victor Emmanuel III was a weak king. The party was, organizationally, subordinate to the state. As a consequence, Italian fascism was a relatively weak and watered-down form of what I'm going to call generic fascism at the risk of a tsunami of pedantic rebuttals. It's not that fascist ideology wasn't revolutionary, but that fascist leaders compromised. That compromise included the peculiar situation of a revolutionary socialist government existing on the sufferance of a king. National Socialist Germany was more of a two-headed beast. On the one hand, the regime made use of the state apparatus that was already in place. The army, the railroads, the postal service, the courts, all kept almost entirely intact with nary a change in personnel. The party could not simply dictate policy to the state. Legal norms and established structures pushed back. So the party duplicated many of the functions of the state. The most dramatic being the Waffen-SS, a whole second army with its own independent command structure and procurement chain. Why? Because the German army had priority conscripting German citizens, but they couldn't conscript non-Germans in occupied territories. But the SS, which was highly restricted in its recruiting of young German men once the war was underway, had a free hand to recruit anywhere else it could establish itself, hence the proliferation of units manned by Norwegians, Frenchmen, Belgians, Albanians, the list goes on. The state and the party stood on roughly equal footing, leading to a lot of turf battles and massive inefficiency. Which we get hints of with the Galactic Empire. For example, the rebellion will continue to gain a support in the Imperial Senate. The Imperial as Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. What's implied here is a dual administration. On the one hand, the Senate had jurisdiction and exerted that authority, but the Emperor also appointed regional governors. There was a massive power overlap until Palpatine dissolved the Senate, in effect making the state subordinate to the party, and finishing what had until then been a partial revolution. This may well have happened in Germany eventually if the regime had survived. The Nazis were only in power for 12 years. Palpatine was emperor for 20 years when he finally booted the Senate. While historically, fascism and national socialism arose as a nationalist mutation of Marxist internationalist aligned socialism, the Galactic Empire poses the question, can a fascist regime rise from different origins? In this old video, I proposed a four-point fascist minimum, focusing entirely on what fascism looks like in operation, ignoring where it comes from. There were a lot of flaws there, and I'm going to attempt to remedy some of them here. First off, by scrapping the weakest point. So, a three-point fascist minimum, or fascist tripod if you prefer. I'll get to Umberto Eco later. Also, just a note, for this I'll tend to use the Marxist convention of small f fascism as an umbrella for Italian fascism, German National Socialism, and their emulators. I'm well aware that they are not the same thing, but we're looking at generalities here. This is more a taxonomic model than a historical one. Fascism can be defined as having a unifying myth, a totalitarian philosophy, and a mixed or third-way economy. I deliberately don't include a non-Marxist socialist origin requirement because, while historically that's important to understand, from a purely is-this-fascist standpoint it doesn't really matter, and the economic point covers the practical substance anyway. I'm going to begin with point three, which is really where fascism differs from communist regimes like the Soviet Union. So, as an example, let's look at the military procurement process in this kind of mixed system and compare it to what we can discern about the Galactic Empire. So, for reference, in the American system, the U.S. Air Force might put out a request for a new fighter, a wish list of what they want. Lockheed and Boeing both think we got this, the government gives them both some money to get started, and eventually they build a brand new aircraft. 
they have a series of trials, a fly-off, and the Air Force picks a winner based on a slate of factors, some sensible metrics and others maybe not so much. The winner, Lockheed in this case, gets a fat contract to build the planes along with spare parts, refits, decades worth of business. They're selling their exclusive product to the state. The Soviet Union did it differently. The Air Force works with the Ministry of Aircraft Production to figure out what they'll need in the future. Then the Ministry punts it to state-run research centers to figure out how to make it work. If they get it sorted, it gets passed on to one or more state-run design bureaus, MiG, Sukhoi, Yakovlev, and they take what the research center came up with and design a plane around it, then build a couple prototypes. Much back and forth with the ministry, and finally a design goes into production, assigned to factories based on what the ministry thinks is best. Sometimes factories mostly affiliated with one design bureau will be assigned to build another bureau's design. It's completely nationalized. The state does what it wants with its factories. National Socialist Germany was kind of a mess with this. You had private companies like Messerschmitt or the Junkers Aircraft Company, but they would often have key people replaced with party bigwigs. The defense contractor Rheinmetall had a majority share of the company purchased by the Reichswerke Hermann Goering, a state-owned industrial conglomerate. Companies weren't Soviet-style state-run design bureaus, but they weren't really private either. Additionally, trade unions were absorbed into the German Labor Front, an NSDAP umbrella organization. Both capital and labor were penetrated by the state and bent to state interests. Is it nationalized? Yes and no. Sort of like modern China in some ways. The state might buy you out, might seize your business, or might just leave you alone as long as you play along. A mix of national policy, profit-seeking business, and graft. With Star Wars, there's no expanded universe books about Sinar fleet systems struggling to meet their tie production quota or other dull contract epics. But we do know that the Empire spacecraft were built by corporations like Quat Drive Yards and Sinar, not by massive state-owned collectives. KDY is owned by the same 10 families that started it generations ago as a private company. They had extensive contracts with the Republic during the Clone Wars and have since transitioned into cozy and profitable service to the Empire. Whether they back the regime out of cynical self-interest or ideological agreement is an open question. Without concrete information on this point, we can't really say if KDY is more like investor-owned modern Lockheed or majority state-owned World War II-era Rheinmetall. So we have to make inferences from incomplete information. We know that the iconic Imperial class Star Destroyer is a KDY design, and Spectre of the Past by Timothy Zahn tells us that the Empire had 25,000 of them. 200 Star Destroyers remaining from a fleet that had once included over 25,000 of them. Other sources concur that the Empire had at least 25,000 Star Destroyers in service at its height. Is this figure correct? Let's make like an economist and assume so. Now some guesswork, or what they call analysis in the intel community. Assuming that the Battle of Yavin, or the original Star Wars for the casual fans, is the height of the Empire based on the Rebellion growing more successful after that point, that gives about 20 years from Palpatine's Empire speech. The Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire! To the Death Star being destroyed, so about 1,250 Star Destroyers built per year if they start right then, assuming roughly steady build rates. I'm not worrying about Imperial 1 versus Imperial 2 class, refits, or any of that. We know that KDY had more facilities than just their main orbital ring at Quat. The Corellia shipyards, not owned by KDY, built Imperial class Star Destroyers. This is established in sources like the Rogue One Visual Guide and the StarWars.com databank, and most recently the Ahsoka series, all of which I admit is a bit tenuous to hang an argument on. But you see how academics can argue about the same quibbling details for generations. In that vein, the old Empire at War PC game gives a dozen or so locations that can build Star Destroyers, all of which suggests that the KDY design was produced not only by that company, but contracted out to others, suggesting a state-managed but not fully nationalized industry. But it's not entirely consistent. Rebels shows us the production of TIE Defenders on Lothal apparently being undertaken by a factory under direct Imperial control, not a subsidiary of Sinar fleet systems working under Imperial oversight. A Soviet model rather than a fascist one. 
This might be an indication that the empire's mixed economy is an expedient measure using existing industries but gradually replacing them with state-owned conglomerates. Or it could be that Rebels is a cartoon and Star Wars has never been good about working out how their society works. But the bulk of information indicates that the Empire is directing private industry rather than seizing direct control of it, at least as a stopgap measure. It's a third-way approach typical of fascist regimes. The terms totalitarian and authoritarian are frequently used interchangeably, but there is a distinction. All governments are authoritarian to some extent, being premised on obey our rules or else. But totalitarianism goes beyond merely demanding obedience. Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. A totalitarian regime infiltrates all aspects of life. While an authoritarian regime will ban certain books, a totalitarian regime might establish a national book club built around approved regime edifying texts. This does not necessarily mean direct state control. While the Soviet Union put the newspapers and publishing houses under direct control of a Communist Party apparatus, Nazi Germany allowed private publishers to exist as long as they didn't print anything that went against the regime. An interesting side note here is the rather vibrant pulp fiction scene in Germany at the time. For example, Sun Ko, Prince of Atlantis, was a print serial that ran for several years about the adventures of an Aryan hero fighting to restore the mighty Atlantean civilization and uplift the primitive peoples of the world. By contrast, there was a detective serial, Der Detective, that ended because the publisher refused to bend the storyline to reflect the state ideology. Instead, the writers killed the character. By 1936, all the pulp publishers still in business were producing entertainment that doubled the state propaganda, but they were doing so as for-profit businesses. The British and American equivalents, comic strips like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, as well as the superhero comics and print serials like Amazing Stories, started the thinly veiled fascist space villains trope that continues in a direct line to Star Wars. We retain the cultural memory of the totalitarianism of the World War II era, and it heavily influences how Star Wars presents the Empire. An oppressive policing presence, a network of informers, criminalization of dissent. The original Star Wars reflects this level of technology, with stormtroopers patrolling the streets, conversations hush when they're near, hose-faced snitches reporting to the authorities. It looks rather quaint now, in part because the original Star Wars taken as a standalone work doesn't really extrapolate how newer technologies can be used by totalitarian regimes. For example, the original film implies that real-time interstellar communication isn't a thing that exists. That's why the Death Star plans were smuggled in a droid instead of transmitted, why Han didn't file a flight plan to Alderaan, why a fugitive Jedi could own a house on Tatooine and go by his real surname without anyone coming for him. It creates a sense of distance that was possible even under 1930s totalitarianism, but is much less accessible with modern technology. The Empire Strikes Back ditched this implied limit with Vader's Call of the Emperor, but even recent portrayals of the Galactic Empire like Rogue One and Andor are still partly rooted in a late 1970s cultural memory of the totalitarian regimes of the 1930s and 40s. But of course, technology has moved on. We live in a world of mass surveillance. People put monitoring devices in their own homes, and almost everyone carries a tracking device in their pocket to map out their daily activities. Modern totalitarianism looks more cyberpunk dystopia than neo-fascist police state. It's noteworthy that Bad Batch pulls the franchise into modern policy ideas with the Empire forcing citizens to get chain codes, a form of universal biometric identification. Those credits won't do you any good without a chain code. New galactic policy. The Mandalorian builds on this, implying that people can be tracked via these codes. But the underlying impulse of totalitarianism doesn't change. The compulsion to control leads to a need to constantly hammer a specific state-approved truth. Whether it's posters on a wall or mass media broadcasts and pervasive censorship, propaganda is a key element of totalitarianism. Because simply demanding obedience isn't enough. People need a narrative to justify the obedience. The state needs to wrap itself in a story. The idea of a unifying myth can manifest in many different ways, and this leads to some misleading simplifications. It's often described as simply nationalism, but this is much too vague. All states are nationalist in the most basic sense, otherwise they wouldn't have flags and borders. But nationalism in a fascist context is something deeper, something that ties the national community together more than a piece of colorful cloth or a language.
This is often condensed down to racism, which also isn't right. While the Nazis made race the core element of their unifying myth, that wasn't the case with Italian fascism. Many members of the fascist party were Jewish, for example. There was no conflict there, their unifying myth was cultural, and as long as an individual was Italian first, a fascist first, that was what mattered. Now, I'm not suggesting that fascist Italy was a cosmopolitan utopia of diversity in the modern neoliberal conception. It was Europe in the 30s. Non-Europeans were largely looked down on across the entire continent. But Italy was no more racist than France or Britain and did not define citizenship by bloodlines. Both Italy and Germany had myths of rebirth, of their people having a great destiny that would be achieved by throwing off the shackles of the past, of democratic softness, of Marxist internationalism. For Germany, it was a concept of an Aryan empire ruling over continental Europe and turning Western Russia into a vast farm to feed them. It was a myth based on the idea of superior blood and spirit. For Italy, it was more about culture, about picking up the mantle of the Roman Empire and taking their rightful place amongst the great powers, part of which involved colonies, catching up with Britain and France and their colonial possessions in Africa. In both cases, that vision involved getting new territory, which required war. Italy invaded Ethiopia and Albania. Germany's appetite was bigger, France and Russia. So what is the Galactic Empire's unifying myth? For a safe and secure society. The Old Republic was ineffective, corrupt, and unresponsive to the needs of its people. The Republic is not what it once was. The Senate is full of greedy, squabbling delegates. There is no interest in the common good. A commission must be appointed. The point... Excuse me, Johnson. Enter the bureaucrats, the true rulers of the Republic. The Jedi were a corrupt cult that tried to assassinate the elected chancellor. The attempt on my life has left me scarred. And to the old. My resolve has never been stronger. But Palpatine survived the treacherous attack, defeated the Separatists, and held the galaxy together, and now the Empire will lead the galaxy forward into a new era of peace and prosperity. It casts the regime as the defender of justice and peace, and it invites everyone to be part of the great future ahead of them. That myth is where the Empire perpetuates its support, not from practical factors like economic growth, cutting through local bureaucracy, or the new high-paying jobs in the defense industry. Mayors and presidents have to worry about these things, but totalitarian regimes above all need a good story, one that makes the people feel important, empowered, special. It's nearly impossible to have a discussion about fascism without someone bringing up Umberto Eco and his 14 points of Ur fascism. I encourage anyone interested in the subject to read Eco, but don't just read Eco and call it done because, frankly, he's not helpful. For example, Eco begins with a discussion on the cult of tradition, containing a lot of generalities, which, fine. Of course, merely being a traditionalist does not make one a fascist, but a syncretic approach fusing tradition with pretty much anything esoteric or weird is symptomatic of ur-fascism. When he gets specific, he says things like this. The most influential theoretical source of the theories of the new Italian rite, Julius Evola, merged the Holy Grail with the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Gonna stop you right there, Bert. Julius Evola was by no means the most influential source of fascist theory. No one took Evola seriously, not Mussolini, not Gentili, not anyone significant in the fascist movement. Right from the start, Eco misrepresents what Italy's fascists said, did, and believed. Eco, in his fifth point, states that fascism is racist by definition, which is historically false. Both Italian fascism under Mussolini and Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists were no more racist than any other European political faction of the time, including the liberal ones, until both fell under the influence of Germany in the later years. I'm not going to belabor every point because it's tedious, but again, I encourage you to read Umberto Eco's essay on Ur-Fascism and really break it down in historical context. It's a tangled web of vague and contradictory assertions wrapped in subjective statements with a few demonstrable falsehoods for flavor.
I don't think Echo is trying to deceive anyone. I just think he's too close to the subject, too emotionally compromised by his own experiences fighting the regime to analyze it with any objectivity. Somewhat more nuanced is the question of Franco's Spain. Many consider the Franco regime to be fascist. Many others, including many academics, do not. I fall into that latter camp, but I concede that there is another way to look at it. From a historian's standpoint, this is why I do not consider Franco Spain to be fascist. Franco came to power as part of a coalition which included the Falangists, who were genuine fascists in the general sense, non-Marxist socialist revolutionaries with a coherent myth of a new Spain. Franco, however, was a conservative military officer from an upper-class family. Very shortly after taking power, he marginalized the Falangists. Franco didn't want a revolutionary restructuring of Spanish society. He wanted stability and to get rid of the communists. And if that meant Franco had to take absolute control of the country with unchecked power the likes of which Hitler could only dream of, well, Franco will carry that burden. Franco's attempt to make the Spanish economy self-sufficient wasn't driven by a socialist ideology of state control of industry, but by shortages during the war and international isolation after. Franco sided with Catholic traditionalists over the homegrown fascists. The Spanish arms industry, set me for example, was state-owned rather than fascist-style third positionist, and the regime was less interested in asserting its national destiny than in securing the benefits of becoming an American vassal like dozens of other essentially conservative anti-communist dictatorships. Franco's regime looks more like simple thuggery or grift rather than a revolution but it's fascesque enough that a looser definition can be made to accommodate it. Which brings home one of the problems with fascism having become such an overused political slur. Common usage is meaningless. Practically everything is fascist to hear some people talk. But if we define it too narrowly, then nothing outside of fascist Italy is fascist, which frankly would be fine, but that's not the lexicon we have. So let me give you two examples that put dents in my own definition. The Soviet Union under Stalin, as part of their industrialization campaign, shifted from a focus on fostering global socialism to a policy of socialism in one country, which sounds a lot like national socialism. So is Stalinism fascist? You could make a decent argument for it if you downplay economic organization as a defining factor. It's why I argue that the third way economic model is a necessary defining characteristic. Another example, if Nazism is a form of militant socialism with Marxist class identity dropped in favor of non-Marxist racial identity, then is modern leftist identity politics a form of Nazism? I feel a disturbance in the forest, as though millions of collectivists just cried out in unison. But it's a defensible argument. I've seen master's theses with a much weaker premise. But why does it matter? Can't I just like Star Wars? Of course, it's primarily entertainment. At the same time, the Empire is a cultural echo. It continues to resonate because we're still living in the wake of the cataclysmic events of the Second World War and its reshuffling of world power. The world of Hitler and Stalin, colonialism and huge armies sweeping across continents didn't just disappear. It shattered, and our world is made of the pieces. History is a continuous flow, not a bunch of discrete packets. And recent Star Wars continues to echo that past. After World War II, the United States absorbed a lot of Germany's scientific and industrial base. The firms that manufactured the Nazi war machines reorganized and did the same work for new masters. This is exactly what we see in the Ahsoka series, with the Imperial shipyards staffed by the same personnel being given new contracts to build for the Republic. The Empire introduced its system of chain code universal IDs to track and control the population. But did the Republic scrap it? I don't know. I've been advised to lay low. If anybody runs my chain code, I'll rot in a cell for the rest of my life. No, they keep right on using it. It subtly reminds us that war isn't just a fight. It's also a mating of organizational systems that produces something new with traits of both sides. The new republic inherits as much from the empire as from the old republic it sought to restore, just as the America that emerged from the end of the Second World War was a very different entity than the one that went in. But that's a topic for another day. Step into my office here, but don't step too far.